Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Trunk Talk. My name is Charlotte. And I'm Gabby. And this is the podcast where we talk about everything in the automotive industry. And today we're doing something a little bit more technical, but still fun enough for everyone to understand. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about? Today we're talking about two different kinds of forced induction systems. We're talking about whistles and whines. We're talking about super and turbos. Basically, two different methods of charging up your engine Oof. and getting you optimal power or maybe optimal efficiency. We're going to learn about that in today's episode. So Charlotte, what are we first going to break down? We're going to break down what is forced induction. So force, <laughs> forced induction is essentially a method used in engines to bring more power into them by bringing more air into them. So it's done into the cylinders and you can do either turbocharging or supercharging. I also kind of just want to disclaim that we're talking about turbocharging and supercharging in a very general sense. There's different kinds yeah. of superchargers. There's a roots type, there's centrifugal type, but there's also different kinds of turbochargers. You can get a twin scroll, you can get a sequential, you can get a single turbo. There's a lot of different options here. We're going to talk about things in a more basic, fun, easy to understand way and give some of our personal opinions along the way too. But don't worry, there's also facts. So shall we start with it? Yeah. So I guess we should first by start off by vehicles that actually don't have any type of charging. Yeah. And those are naturally aspirated right. engines. So those are vehicles like my Kia Forte with a two liter naturally aspirated four cylinder. It brings air in at atmospherical pressure. So there's not overly a lot of power going on over there. There's no supercharger, there's no turbocharger. I mean, hypothetically, I could add one if I wanted to. Doesn't make, a lot of sense. <laughs> Doesn't make a lot of sense though. So when air is being brought in at atmospheric pressure, it's gonna limit the amount of fuel that can be burned and power output isn't going to be overly that drastic. I yeah. mean, it's gonna work, it's gonna be fine, it's gonna be okay for a regular vehicle, but if you're someone who appreciates a performance car, just wants a little bit more pep in their step, you're gonna wanna look at a turbocharged engine most likely, or if you want a lot of extra pep in your step, a supercharger. So essentially, that is going to bring your force induction in by means of either your turbo or supercharger. Air pressure is gonna go up and power output will also go up sequentially. <laughs> wow, you don't say. You don't say. So that's a little bit technical, but I promise we'll break it down a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. So should we start off with superchargers or turbochargers? I think we should start off with superchargers. Super. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially a super... <laughs> a supercharger is directly driven by the engine, and that's one of the biggest differences between a supercharger and a turbocharger Definitely. in the most general sense. So what that means is it's actually connected to your vehicle's system. So that means it is always on. Turbochargers are going to act a little bit different. I'll let Charlotte explain that a little bit later on. But essentially, when your vehicle's running, your supercharger is running, and that means you're going to be a little bit hungrier on the fuel, but you're always going to have that linear power. More specifically, a root style turbocharger, it's always going to have that equal amount of power. So whether it's right off the line or mid-range in your quarter mile, you're going to have that same amount of power at all times. There's no real bumps or divots in the power delivery. That of course will change based off the type of supercharger that is in your vehicle, mm -hmm. but for the most part, it's going to be instant power. Very similar to what we experience with EVs, but we're not talking about that yeah, today. Yeah, don't worry. We're, we're keeping it with the classics. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So it's directly driven by the engine. As the engine runs, the supercharger is gonna spin and compress that incoming air, pushing it into the engine at higher pressure, and this is gonna allow more fuel to burn, like I spoke about earlier. It's gonna result in more power, quicker acceleration, and unlike the turbo that utilizes the exhaust gas to spin, superchargers Spoiler. are gonna be <laughs> instant in its power delivery because it's always connected to the engine. Again, pros, instant power delivery, consistent levels of power, one thing I really notice when I drive a turbocharged vehicle is it's going to feel a little bit more fluttery and you may absolutely love that, but I will say when it comes to, I want to say drag racing more specifically, it's nice to have just that instant constant power delivery. And of course this will vary based off what your preferences are, but that's just what I like. They're also going to be a lot more simple in their design, so they're fairly easy to actually install. You don't have to be a crazy mechanic. To so install is this a DIY? Is this a DIY? DIY? Is this going to be DIY our next video, video coming soon? <laughs> Another thing, and this is totally subjective, but I'm going to save the sound. So <laughs> I I could try to replicate it, but it's going to sound no. More, please do. Uh, okay. <laughs> Turbochargers have a beautiful, beautiful whine. When I hear that whine, all I think about is power. I think about a Hellcat. I think about a GT500. Mm -hmm. I think about some crazy muscle car. You may also think about the Volvo or perhaps even a Toyota Previa, which is a 90s mid-engine supercharged minivan. Whoa! Yeah, so superchargers can quite literally be in anything, and that's what makes them, I guess, really interesting. 
Superchargers, they're kind of on their way out when it comes to factory equipped vehicles with a supercharger, supercharged engine. <laughs> We don't see a lot of them now. You're going to see them mostly on your domestic muscle yeah. cars. You're not going to see them really on anything else. But I will say in the aftermarket scene, superchargers are not going anywhere. It's way easier easier to replace an intake manifold on a vehicle to add a supercharger to it than it is to reroute everything, including your intake and your exhaust, to do a turbocharged swap. Yeah. So it's a lot easier. doesn't mean it's exactly cost effective, but it will be cheaper than putting a turbo system on your vehicle. I guess also depending on what vehicle you're running and what systems you're looking at. But really cool option. Really love the sound. Really love the instant power delivery. Not very fuel efficient again. That's the only con I can think of. There is also parasitic drag loss, but yeah. nonetheless. What about turbos? You're, you're like, that's a conversation for another time. That's a, that's a conversation for another time. We're just really excited to talk about supercharged cars. I'm very excited to talk about them. I think they're very, very cool. Driving one is quite a treat, and it's very, very different. It's very different. I feel like it's more of a novelty, too. Kind yeah. of like what you're saying, just because you don't see them on many factory-installed vehicles, you have to find someone who's almost, like, tuned their vehicle to it. I so. think, also, to be fair, you can drive, I don't know, if you bring me 10 vehicles, a good chunk of them will be turbocharged, yeah. but probably none of them are going to be supercharged. The only time we see a supercharged car, really, is going to be on a high-performance vehicle, yeah. so obviously it's going to be a lot of fun, you know what I mean? Or a very highly modified vehicle, someone that added a supercharger. Which is also it. a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> but then there's things like the Elantra N-Line, which does have a turbocharger, and mm -hmm. it is a little bit more fun than a more eco-turbo. But yes, uh, yeah. again, there's... Something that's designed more so for power than necessarily yeah. the efficiency aspect. We're talking it. about this in such a broad sense, but it really is super complicated. Yeah. I think it's more complicated for turbo. So Charlotte, break it down. What oh, is it? great. <laughs> I'm so lucky that I get this one. So I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple, just kind of like what Gabby was saying. And guys, I even have notes today that way <laughs> I don't fumble over my words so I can explain everything as streamlined as possible, hopefully. So what are turbochargers? Gabby gave us a little bit of a sneak preview. So like superchargers, they're, a, they're another method of forced induction where they differ. So they're not necessarily drawing power uh, specifically from the engine. They're drawing it from the exhaust gases. And what those are going to do is they're going to drive the turbine um, that compresses the intake air, allowing for more air and subsequently more fuel to enter into the engine, which is going to give you more powerful combustion. And that's going to equate to more powerful performance. Does that make sense? <laughs> Maybe. If you're like me, you're probably picturing a diagram in your brain and you're seeing everything snake through. No? Okay. No, I don't. I, uh, I can't picture anything in my brain ever. It just goes blank. <laughs> Anytime right. someone's describing something to me, nothing happens up there. I'm just listening. <laughs> uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the pros of a turbocharger because, again, this is what we're seeing a lot more of and a lot of what manufacturers are tending to drift towards. And, again, like what Gabby's saying is we see turbochargers a lot more because they can be used in more so of an efficient sake, too. And so that will kind of be my first pro is that the fuel efficiency is because they are more fuel efficient, they get I thought more... this was a fun podcast. <laughs> Apparently not. We're talking about fuel efficiency. We're talking about thermal dynamics fuel efficiency. Um, but it's going to deliver more power with less consumption and it's because it's making use of those exhaust gases as well. Um, obviously one of the very obvious pros is going to be increased power too. So it's going to boost the engine power without necessarily increasing size. So you can take something like a 1.6 liter turbo and you can actually see better numbers than maybe a 2 liter naturally aspirated counterpart. So I think that that is something that's really cool is you don't necessarily have to go up uh, but if you had a turbo charger on there, you still get a lot of fun, a lot of power, and can sometimes reap the benefits of fuel economy depending on how you drive, of course. Uh, and of course, it's a pretty economical means of increasing your horse. Of course, of course. Of course, of course. So let's talk about cons, and Gabby already talked about them and probably touched on the biggest one, which is going to be turbo lag, which is something that everybody loves. But basically what turbo lag is, is there can sometimes be a lag or a slight delay, uh, basically from when the throttle is open to the time it takes for that increased power to really be delivered. So for those exhaust gases to go and actually spin that turbine uh, and allowing things to give you that more, that little bit of a power boost, which is sometimes where you can find that more of a fluttery feeling. Turbo lag is something that has greatly been improved over the years. We're not living in the era of the Widowmaker anymore, <laughs> where uh, basically if you get in a car called the Widowmaker, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to leave a pretty wealthy widow, <laughs> depending on the car. <laughs> 
Um, to the point where turbo lag, it's still something that you're going to feel a little bit, but not to the same degree. It's generally about one second, which can make a big difference, especially if, like what Gabby said, is your goal is drag racing, your goal is in performance. Uh, but if it's something, you know, like my Kia Sorento, which is a 2.5 liter turbo, it's not necessarily something that you're really going to be feeling as much in your daily drive. It's going to be more so of a comparison for your performance vehicles. Man, this is I'll not argue, that much fun. I'm I'll talking argue about with that. You think, yeah? You I'll think you can feel the turbo lag? No, 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 not the turbo lag. Oh. How you said it's more not something you feel in your daily driving. Yeah, I don't think so. So I will say, so for the Kia Sorento, you can get the 2.5 liter naturally aspirated yeah. or you can get the 2.5 turbo. The difference between the two is night and day. Yeah. Absolute night and day. So I would definitely notice a difference in daily driving, even though that may not be a performance car turbo. That is a huge performance difference. I Sorry. When I was saying you may not notice a difference, I was saying that in turbo legs specifically. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no. There's definitely a difference between say. naturally aspirated and turbo. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was a huge difference. You're like looking at me and you're like, are you stupid? <laughs> like, what do you mean you don't feel a difference? <laughs> but yeah, no. That would be crazy. You definitely do. But in comparison with turbo leg, no. Uh, I got off track there. Cons, obviously cost and complexity. Again, Gabby talked about this a little bit is they are a lot more complex when it comes to actually installing. And again, it's going to depend on what vehicle it is. It's going to depend on which type you're going with as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple variables and that's the problem with doing something so general. But overall, yes, they are a little bit more complex, which means you pay more for the parts. You can pay more for the labor too when it comes to maintenance and repairs too. Um, heat. Also, they generate a lot more heat than a naturally aspirated counterpart, so there's usually going to have to be some type of increased cooling too, um, which is something to configure or something to consider if you are going and tuning your vehicle. I'd say yeah. so. There's probably going to be some other things that'll need to be adjusted for you, but I think that really covers turbos as a whole. I was going to say in a same. general broad sense. <laughs> ah. The same in regards to heat is the same is true for superchargers as well too. However, it really depends on the type of supercharger that's yeah. on your car, where it's mounted. Um, you may need an intercooler. Yeah. I feel like it's recommended anyway, but nonetheless. Um, <laughs> weight reduction though. <laughs> weight reduction. So yeah, both of these vehicles, I mean, there's definitely a lot more you can do with the turbo, I will say, or a lot more applications for a turbo. And I understand why that is the most common in today's yeah. date. Because I mean, manufacturers have to meet fuel regulations or uh, Economy regulations, I should say, and you just can't do that with the supercharger. <laughs> so the, su the supercharger takes that in for it, and they're like, "Yeah, no," yeah. and they throw it completely out the window. Yeah, and I mean, I will say, I would consider them more fun just because of the vehicles that you'll find them on. But turbochargers are tons of fun too. Some of my favorite vehicles ever do come with the turbocharger, mm -hmm. so it's it's a little bit tricky. So here's a good question, in, and let's keep it in a general sense again: Is when do you think someone should choose a supercharger versus a turbocharger? I think it just depends on what your goals are. If you're looking for a new SUV, don't get a supercharger. <laughs> and I mean, okay, I, I just said that a lot of performance cars will have superchargers. More so everyday cars won't. Mm -hmm. But there's things like the Land Rover had superchargers. Yep. So yep. Plenty of supercharger options. Same with Jaguar. Um, you could get Volvos Jag with superchargers. Yeah, Volvo. So those are more, I guess, they had sedans, they had SUVs with supercharged options. That is going to be a little bit more of a regular everyday car, but still a little bit more fun. Not going to be very economical at all, no. both in acquisition cost and maintenance cost, because, I mean, they're going to consume a lot more fuel, and they're expensive. Those are premium brands, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for a lot of people, but if you value fun, power, and reliability, reli reliability, I say very loosely, <laughs> race cars are not reliable, um, <laughs> definitely supercharger might be more your style. Yeah. So. Definitely. Mm -hmm. It's always fun getting that immediate boost of power instead of necessarily having to wait for it to kind of kick in. Um, I think if you are considering, if you're shopping around for a new vehicle that is just for your everyday, turbo again is more than likely going to be the way to go. Um, generally due to the efficiency because they're becoming a little bit more streamlined in our everyday vehicles, I'd say that they're probably a little bit more affordable if you're purchasing a vehicle from factory with it, with it equipped. Yeah. And again, there's also kind of a little bit of a gap in the market because we don't necessarily see superchargers for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd probably say that. But what's your favorite supercharger? What's your favorite turbocharger? Okay, favorite turbocharger is definitely going to be Porsche 911. Yeah. Turbo. Duh. 930 to be specific. So the Widowmaker. The Widowmaker. 
I spoke about this in another podcast episode, why it's called the Widowmaker. Mm -hmm. Absolutely insane. Just truly, so go and check that out. Yeah, truly a terrifying car. I've never driven a 930, but I have driven quite a few different variants of 911, mm -hmm. including the GT2 RS, which absolutely scared the life out of me. Anyway, um, favorite supercharger. This one's not exactly a high performance, crazy, crazy, crazy car, but I have a deep connection to the Cadillac XLR oh, V. Oh, that's a fun choice. <laughs> Why? What's your connection? I think ever since watching Sons of Anarchy, I just really, I really vibed with it. It's a, such an ugly. It, and guys, I don't know. It's not that ugly actually. I like to think I like ugly cars, but yeah. They're beautiful to me. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that are kind of, yeah. What about you? Uh, so this is a random one for supercharged, but the uh, S SVT Cobra. So I don't know why. I just remember I, I feel like I saw them as a kid, and I was like, oh, wow, that's a cool car. And I look back at them now, and I'm like, that's not necessarily, like, a cool car. Like, it's not blowing me away in terms of aesthetics or anything like that. Like, it, you know, it looks like an early 2000s car. Which sometimes I kind of vibe with, so I do like that. I feel like you know, if we don't mention Hellcat, that's almost blasphemy when it comes to yeah. superchargers. So. I was trying not to say anything, uh, but <laughs> dang it, I did it. And then uh, when it comes to turbocharged, obviously my Kia Sorento. Obviously, if we're talking uh, twin turbo, great car, seriously fantastic. If we're talking car. twin turbo, I don't know if I can loop that in, but I love a F40. Um, I think that they're beautiful cars. Have I ever been able to drive one? No. Why would I? But they're beautiful. They're very beautiful. Uh, it's my, one of my cur current hyperfixation cars. Yeah, I will say a lot of the modern performance vehicles are driven with turbochargers. I mean, you don't really notice the lag. You're just yeah. more so swept away with the car. Yeah. Um, but yeah, fantastic vehicle. Seriously crazy. I want to drive more supercharged cars. So if any of you guys have a supercharged car, please bring it by to Brantford Key. Let me drive We're it. located at 214 Linden <laughs> Road, Brantford, <laughs> Ontario. <laughs> I'll take a GT500. <laughs> uh, guys, I'm not asking for much. It's just, it's the little things. It, it's the little things. Also, I think honorable mention again, I think I mentioned it earlier at some point in this podcast episode, but the Toyota Previa. What is that what you want to drive? No. <laughs> <laughs> no power, but it was supercharged. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's a, another good note. Not every supercharged car has to blow your socks off. Like, yeah. They, they could just be a mid-engine van. And it's I from think Japan. there's something beautiful about that. So I think there's something to be said about <laughs> and that. And I don't think that we can top this episode after ending on that note. No. So I think we better just quit while we're ahead. <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys so much for joining us today in today's episode. We hope that you guys had some fun as we talk about superchargers and turbochargers, why we think they're fun, why we enjoy them, and also with the hopes of driving them a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But before we go, what are we sitting in the back of today? So we're sitting in the back of a 2024 Kia Telluride SX in Ooh. wolf gray. There you go. Mm -hmm. It's neither turbo nor, nor supercharged. Super. <laughs> Naturally aspirated. But you know what? There's no replacement for displacement. Thank you guys for watching. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>